Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another episode of The Safe Space. My name is Brandy Lowry. I am a staff attorney with Lone Star Legal Aid, and I am in the Individual Safety Unit out of Houston. And Brittany? My name is Brittany Hightower. I am also a staff attorney with the Individual Safety Unit, and my office is out of Belton. Thank y'all again for tuning in to another episode. This episode, we will be talking about sexual harassment in the workplace. And before we get started, let's begin our disclaimer. This presentation is intended to serve as legal information and does not replace legal advice. Contact Lone Star Legal Aid at 1-800-733-8394, or you can go to our website at www.lonestarlegal.org for more information on legal assistance. Again, thank everybody for joining in to another episode. Happy fall. We have two amazing guests. I'm very excited about this episode because one of them is a good friend of mine and one of my, my golf president, we play golf together <laughs> of our organization, <laughs> um, to talk about this very important topic of sexual harassment in the workplace. So Vanessa, please introduce everybody to our audience. Hello, I am Vanessa Davis. I am an HR professional with Mr. Cooper, which is a mortgage servicing and based out of Dallas. And Colleen, please introduce yourself to our lovely audience. Hi, my name is Colleen Mulholland, and I am a staff attorney at the Equal Justice Center in San Antonio. The Equal Justice Center is a nonprofit law firm that handles litigation um, related to employment issues for low-wage workers. Cool beans. Brittany, you want to go and kick us off? Uh, yeah, I would love to. Um, so let's get started in kind of with a definition or an explanation of what we are talking about. What is sexual harassment in the workplace? How is it defined? And Vanessa, let's start with you. Okay, so from an HR perspective, um, sexual harassment in the workplace is any unwelcome sexual advance, whether that's a gesture, a joke, a comment, um, any kind of sexual favor that is unwarranted. Um, and it could be of a sexual nature or directly related to um, in an, an employee based upon their sex. And Colleen, do you want to give us maybe a legal definition or the definition from a lawyer's perspective? Sure. And what I'm most familiar with is a practice in federal court, but the um, in Texas, at least, the state court um, and the state law mirrors what the federal law um, says about sexual harassment and that that it's unlawful to harass a person either an applicant for a job or an employee because of that person's sex um, and harassment can include uh, unwelcome sexual advances requests for sexual favors other verbal verbal or physical harassment of a sexual nature and it's important an important distinction which we can get into a little bit more is that um, while to you or I, it may be very inappropriate or, or unacceptable, the law doesn't prohibit what's considered simple teasing, offhand comments, isolated incidents that aren't very serious. Um, when harassment is illegal is when it's so frequent or severe that it creates a hostile or offensive work environment or when it results in an adverse employment decision, meaning most typically that the victim of the harassment is fired or demoted. So I would like to follow up on what you said, Colleen, in regards to simple teasing. And this is, could be a question for a response from both of y'all. So simple teasing, according to the law, is not really considered sexual harassment. So if I'm offended because um, a male colleague of mine compliments I don't know, like, oh, your shirt is particularly cute and it's kind of low or something, you know, makes reference to my clothing and it's kind of revealing and I'm uncomfortable. Well, and he's just teasing, but I'm offended. What can I do to, um, what can I do about that? Because if the law is not going to take that into consideration, because it has to be so severe to where I have to get a demotion, then is there like anything in place for me to do? And this is for both of y'all. Sure. So it's important to realize that when we talk about legal claims um, for sexual harassment, we're often looking at what is the company's responsibility or liability. Um, and, you know, issues like you described may not make the company liable for taking certain course of action. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't speak up for yourself and that you shouldn't complain. I mean, there's always a risk that if you complain and the behavior itself wasn't considered illegal, um, 
that you, you may not be as protected from retaliation as if the complaint was about a behavior that was illegal. Um, but we certainly, and Vanessa, I think, can speak to this, you know, the idea of HR um, and even companies that don't have HR but have a company ethics or a guiding statement is that they are there to intervene at the time at which it may just be considered silly um, before it rises to a level. And one, the company is protecting itself. <laughs> they right. don't want to be hit with a sexual harassment claim that could be successful. So they really should step in. It doesn't always happen. Um, but it's not a reason not to speak up. Because the example that I'm thinking about, and Vanessa, I'm definitely going to let you respond, is like, you know, when women work in a male-dominant environment, such as, you know, if there's a female mechanic amongst all men, and she's having to deal with the teasing, the backlash, you know, and they're just saying, oh, we're just playing. So that's kind of where I was going towards mm -hmm. in that, you know, aspect. But go ahead, Vanessa. So in a lot of environments, especially one like, like you're describing, um, some behavior tends to be the norm. Um, so sometimes those, um, if you want to call them harassers, offenders, they may not always know. Um, so that's why it's important for companies to have what they call sensitivity training. Um, sometimes they have the sexual harassment training so that it is known what can be considered as sexual harassment. Um, and so from again, from the example that you sh that you stated, if someone makes a comment about the clothes that you're wearing, from an HR perspective, if that comment is made and it makes you uncomfortable, it is our job to make sure we do our due diligence to investigate that claim. Um, whether that's having conversations, whether that's talking to those that have been, you know, a witness to the conversation and to diffuse it before it gets to the level of going to Colleen. Actually, I want to piggyback on that. And, and with Brandy's in, insightful little hypothetical example, I worked in the service industry for well over a decade before I became a lawyer. And that industry, as I'm sure both of you are well aware, is it's pretty pervasive. Sexual harassment is just kind of part of the culture within the restaurant industry. And so I, I kind of wonder, how does that work out when that seems to be part of the culture? It's, it's mm -hmm. seen as good humor teasing. It's not men sexually harassing their female subordinates. It's, it's just kind of this whole culture. Like, where, where does that line fall? I think the law, and this applies to many issue areas, is very much behind um, the kind of the attitude we've developed in the kind of post Me Too era um, of where we expect more um, and where, you know, more and more people are either they always believe this or coming to the realization that, you know, women should not be just expected to put up with this um, mm -hmm. in the course of doing their job. And I don't, because so much of, you know, when a judge makes a decision, that judge is basing his, his or her decision off of a whole series of cases that came before your case. And those cases go back 1970s, 80s, even before um, when the workplace was even more male dominated and what, you know, um, you were expected to put up with a lot more. Um, so we're behind the times and I do think it's changing, but it's changing slowly. But I think you pick up on a really important and um, difficult point that, you know, a law applies to everyone. Um, not everyone works in the service industry, um, but you have to fit your claims within a law that wasn't necessarily made, especially for you. And you do just develop these kind of situational norms where um, what may be unacceptable in a workplace with professionals that have a graduate degree is not considered um, unacceptable in a workplace where workers are less educated, or they have different cultural backgrounds, you could, you know, fill in the different factors, et cetera. So not really an answer to your question, but definitely an acknowledgement that um, there's no common, um, you know, women in different industries and different sectors are experiencing very different things that, you know, I'm not facing myself for many reasons. Right, and, and keep in mind too, that just because that there is certain um, behavior that is acceptable in a certain industry, doesn't mean that it is not uh, susceptible to a corrective action. So basically the thing is, just because it's accepted doesn't mean it's right. Because even if the, the restaurant industry is saying, oh, you know, we allow this, I'm not gonna say allow this to go, that it goes on, it doesn't necessarily, it's not right. 
even like those that are working in male dominant or even women dominated because you know it is men and women that are being sexual harassed so we don't want to you know focus on one gender not the other so reiterating just because it's the norm per se or that norm in that culture it's still not right correct right. and sexual harassment can um you know it's not it can there can be claims um or related claims that stem from being harassed by a client a customer mm -hmm. um, by a coworker, by a supervisor you know there's there's different aspects or different factors you look at depending on who the harasser is but it's certainly part of a company's responsibility to protect their workers if they are aware um, that their customers are harassing the employees. Can you talk about that a little bit more? I'm curious about that because I think, I'm trying to think of what the Michael Douglas movie was where you know, sexual harassment came out as an issue and we started talking about it. And then of course they made a movie about a man's female boss sexually harassing him. But, oh, um, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, I think we're all familiar with that trope that it's a supervisor who's sexually harassing a subordinate who doesn't really have a lot of a lot of options or feels like they don't have a lot of options but um sexual harassment by customers i think is pretty pervasive in a lot of industries that are customer facing and i feel like it's only gotten worse as a result of the pandemic it, can you kind of talk a little bit about what that looks like from an employer's responsibility perspective or what somebody can expect their employer to do to protect them in that situation when when it happens and whether it's a, a customer, a client, um, that behavior does need to be reported. Um, if reported to your immediate supervisor, you can report it to HR. In most companies nowadays, they have a confidential line, an ombudsman line. Um, but we need to make sure that the behavior is reported. That is the only way that we can take action. Um, whether the, the behavior is directed at you or you are a witness to the behavior, it can still be reported. Um, again, that is the only way that we're gonna know to take action. So depending on the company, depending on relationship, um, then that is where your, the company should take action towards that customer to either you know, rectify or sever the relationship and the same as it pertains to the client relationship. Yeah, I so, don't have, oh, sorry, oh, no, go, go ahead. ahead. No, go ahead, no, Carla. I don't have much more to add other than to echo, you know, from a legal perspective, if in the future you are potentially trying to bring a claim against an employer, reporting is essential. Um, you know, there's some very specific situations where it's virtually impossible for a person to report, and that could be where the, you know, one and only boss is the harasser, and it's not really feasible to report to the person who harassed you. But in many, many, many people's workplaces, there are superiors um, that they can report those issues to. And that's, you know, if the company never knows about it, it can be difficult to get the company on a hook um, from in, in the context of a, a lawsuit. Yeah. So if no issue is too small. You know, you may think the customer may never come back. Well, it turns out the customer does come back and the customer does something worse the next time but you never told the company what had happened with the customer the first time. It doesn't mean that you don't have a claim, um, but you, you wanna protect yourself. And those complaints should be really made in writing um, or consider having a witness um, to you making a complaint. If there's someone you feel comfortable with and someone you trust, um, those are just kind of general practical tips. Yeah, and it is the company's responsibility to provide a safe work environment. So, you know, we want those complaints. We want to be able to investigate. So we had a really interesting conversation offline briefly when we were talking about perpetrators versus harassers. And this is starting off, this is a really great conversation, by the way. Like this is phenomenal. Um, so who, we kind of touched on this and we've been talking about it, but who is considered a harasser? Like, what is that? Well, I would say, what does that look like? But we're getting examples. So I guess legally, what is considered, who is considered a harasser? And what is a, why is it better to say basically harasser versus like a perpetrator? So anybody can be an harasser. So I think it's something that Colleen touched on earlier. It's, it could be a supervisor. It could be a manager. It could be a coworker. It could be a customer. It could be a client. It could, a, a perpetrator doesn't, I mean, I'm sorry, a, a harasser doesn't necessarily have a specific face 
right? So it's anyone that is that makes that suggestive comment, that makes that suggestive joke. So there is no actual defined look, if you will, to what a har harasser is. And I like how y'all brought in the customer side too, because a lot of times, you know, people don't think that they're being, they're the harasser when they're going like to discount tires and they're, you know, flirting with the um, the person and the person could be offended. And that that person can also not even necessarily know that they're being sexually harassed. So I like how y'all brought that on the customer. But Colleen, go ahead. Yeah, so I mean, there's a lot of different words you can use um, and some of them become like a little bit more legalese than others. Um, typically, perpetrator is used in the criminal justice system, and in, in the United States, we have a civil system and a criminal system, um, and most often in the sexual harassment context, um, we're dealing with cases in the civil system. Um, there can absolutely be overlap with the criminal system, um, you know, in more serious cases where there may have been a sexual assault in the workplace, which does fall under sexual harassment under the law. Um, you know, there may very well be a criminal case against the individual, and the criminal case may call that person the perpetrator. Um, in the civil system, we're typically looking at claims against the employer, but you can also bring civil claims against the individual. Um, but the civil system doesn't use the word perpetrator, and you'll see um, the harasser, the accused, um, the respondent, the defendant. Uh, so they're big words, but we're, we're talking about the person who did the bad thing. Alleged. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> they allegedly made this comment. <laughs> so I know we're going to get into kind of um, some courses of action you can take later on down the road, potentially court cases calling like you just touched on within the civil system. But let's kind of stay for a little bit within the realm of what the employer can do. Let's say you've got a great employer. They take their responsibilities very seriously. You go and you report to them. What are some of the things the employer are allowed to do in order to address the situation? First, I think um, every employee should be familiar with the employee handbook um, because the policy of filing a complaint will be listed in there. And it's important to hold your company accountable to that policy. So in, in most cases, you will report the incident. Um, again, whether we, I personally, I don't prefer that an employee goes to their manager. I prefer that they go directly to an HR person because we're an impartial body. Um, and what you say to us stays confidential. Um, it doesn't go to your manager. So the, my preference in course of action is reporting that to your HR professional. Um, once it gets reported to me, it's an actual live claim that has to be investigated um, and, and it's documented. You should have a conversation with that HR person to get all of the specific details pertaining to that complaint. Um, you name any witnesses that could have um, heard or saw that behavior and then that HR person will start an, an, a confidential investigation into the claim. Um, none of the, your personal information, nothing pertaining to you filing the claim should be known to anyone um, while this investigation is going on. So once an, uh, a resolution is determined, then one, the HR professional is going to continue to document that. Two, depending on the severity of the claim, there could, there could be corrective action that takes place. Um, and uh, in some cases, um, the complainant is not satisfied with the determination from HR. And at that point, um, I've, I've seen where a lot of complainants will go and seek legal counsel which can turn into either an EEOC claim, or there are some lawyers that will take the, cl take the claim, contact the company um, to try to get some type of mediation or resolution on, on that front. And I think from kind of a lay person's perspective of what the employer can do for them if they complain, um, I think the most, con you know, assuming the, the result of the investigation was that either 
something happened or we can't determine if something happened, which is, I think, a lot of the cases. Um, but we are willing to make a change to make you feel comfortable at work. And I think most often that's going to be changing your shift so that you don't overlap with the harasser. And then granted, this is only possible in certain workplaces, you know, one that doesn't have just one shift. Um, but that's a common one we see. Um, they're for big companies that have many locations. They can um, offer a transfer. Um, I think these are often points of contention, like Vanessa mentioned with the complainant, because um, you know, often the company is offering to transfer or change the shift of the complainant, of the victim. And people can see that as being persecuted um, because they're like, I complain, you obviously don't believe me. And now I can go somewhere else. Well, thank you very much. Um, which you have to be careful just from a legal perspective because it may not be fair. Um, but you know, once the company has made these offers, you know, assuming they're genuine and that the location isn't miles and miles away or some other hardship, um, you know, that may have been enough for the company to satisfy its burden under the law. Um, and ideally you're working with a company who has this kind of practice of having a reasonable dialogue and you feel comfortable expressing these concerns. Like I have a childcare issue. Is there anything else we could do? You know, maybe the, if the warehouse, maybe it's just a question of not changing the shift, but changing the workstation. Um, but, and I've seen it go many ways. Not every company, um, you know, not every company has HR, not all HR professionals um, are as willing or qualified as Vanessa. Um, so it, it, it can vary. And keep in mind too, it, it does vary also between um, environments that are unionized and those mm -hmm. that are not. And I think one thing that maybe upsets complainants the most is that it's often not the result that the company decides to fire um, the, the accused or the harasser. And that's just, you know, I've seen it many times that people are just really torn, um, you know, and they're often survivors of trauma in other settings in their life. And it is very difficult to return to the workplace, you know, feeling that you're mental and physical safety is in danger. And, and there's often like kind of a misunderstanding of what companies are required to do under the law, which is not necessarily to fire people, um, but to create safe working environments. So then for those that decide to, so those that decide HR didn't do their part or, you know, the companies tried, but they weren't satisfied, then they tend to file an EEOC complaint. What does that look like and how does that process start? Um, so the EEOC stands for the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and it's a federal agency that enforces anti-discrimination laws in the workplace um, on a federal level. There's also the Texas Workforce Commission, um, which has the same type of um, enforcement responsibilities just under state law. But most often people go to the EEOC and they actually end up filing a charge that's automatically filed with the Texas Workforce Commission as well. Um, that process is, um, you can visit their website. They have an online portal in which you can in initiate the process. Um, the first, like the operative document um, to file a claim is called a charge of discrimination. Um, and it's basically a form where you lay out some biographical information, the basis of your, um, the discrimination you experience, and I think they call it the particulars. So a narrative of what happened to you um, that's filed or submitted to the EEOC and various things can happen next. Um, most typical is that the EEOC will assign an investigator and that's someone who um, will contact the company, notify them that you've made a charge, send the company the charge you filed with the EEOC, give them an opportunity to respond um, and depending on the response, they may ask you, the person who filed, for more information. Um, they may go to the company um, and, and do interviews, ask to see paperwork. Um, in a lot of cases, they don't do that, and that's because the EEOC is incredibly under-resourced. There's just many, many claims for very few workers and a very small budget. Um, and so I can continue with the explanation of that process, but that's how you get started. But I think the most important thing to know um, is that there are deadlines. And so almost all legal claims have deadlines. 
for the EEOC, you're looking at a 300 day deadline from the day the discrimination occurred. Um, so you can wait a little bit, but you can't wait a long time. And if you wait longer than 300 days, you may just be out of luck in terms of pursuing that legal claim. Um, and it sounds like a long time when you say it, 300 days. But what we often see is that, um, you know, especially in cases of low wage immigrant um, workers in that demographic, people who experience sexual harassment is often not the first time they've experienced something like that in their lives. And they may have pretty severe trauma from a prior experience or developed it from this incident. Um, and a very rational response to trauma is to avoid um, avoid thinking about that situation, um, either because you cannot bring yourself to address it, um, or the only way you can function in your day-to-day -day life and like support your family, have a new job, is to not revisit that harm. And so you wait more than 300 days. Um, or you're looking for a lawyer, you don't find one, 300 days pass. It's more common than you think. So that's something really important to remember. But even with the EEOC, you necessarily, in regards to the deadline, you don't have to have a, um, an attorney at that time. It's like, it's go ahead and apply and file your complaint with them. And then you can be looking for a lawyer in the process. And I think as well, if the EEOC, and correct me if I'm wrong, they may appoint you an attorney if they um, if they file that there's some validation, validation to your claim. Is that correct? Like towards I'm, Sorry, I'm not no. familiar with that. Um, granted, most of my experience with the EEOC is being the lawyer um, for someone, so they wouldn't necessarily be, I've never been contacted by the EEOC and asked to, or uh, appointed. So, I mean, the EEOC is designed, so you don't need a lawyer. I do think people tend to have a better likelihood of success if they can find a lawyer, as in most situations. Um, but the idea is that you, as a you know worker, can seek to enforce your rights on your own. Yeah, in in most cases, to Colleen's point, you don't need um, an attorney. Um, when you go through the EEOC, they go through steps that it result in mediation. They try mm -hmm. to get it mediated before it gets to the point of, you know, the right to sue and, and where you have to go out and get legal counsel. So more times than not, the mediator that you're meeting with um, is looking for a way that both parties can actually come to, you know, that that agreement before moving forward. But what if one party decides that they don't want to mediate? I'm sorry, Colleen, go ahead. No, that's exactly what I was going to say. Mediation at the EEOC stage is optional. And so if the company declines, there is no mediation. I mean, some companies, it's their practice to do that because it often is the best opportunity. Um, you're not, even if you attend mediation, you are not required to accept what is offered to you, either on the company side or the individual side. Um, so, you know, from our perspective, it's important to go and if nothing else, learn about what each, what each party is saying, is saying happen. Um, and there's often... Good. We always want to, it's a fine line, so you don't want to pressure people into taking less than what they may be entitled to. But there are many good reasons why settling or resolving things early on um, are, you know, in the interest of both parties. And some of that does get back to that kind of mental health, um, where some people, they just need to close the door and move on. Can you make, like in a mediation request, can somebody like request that the company look into sensitivity training or some type of training for the employees? Is that part of a mediation discussion? And um, Vanessa, have you had an experience with that where an employee has said that they wanted um, the company to like do more in sensitivity training? And this is for have, Okay, I have had that. Um, and I mean, yes, it can come up in negotiation in, in mediation, but uh, to Colleen's point, a company does not necessarily have to, to hmm. use that as a means of solution. It's definitely, I think, you know, the EEOC, their role as a public service institution is to not just solve your problem, but stop um, harassment in the workplace, um, stop discrimination in the workplace. 
So that is something the EEOC is usually on board with requesting, you know, whether it actually happens or a company agrees to it, I think is a, you know, a bigger question and an unknown, very case by case specific. But as far as like the EEOC, that is one of their, you know, mission statements is to um, put practices in place and they work with employers to do this um, so that this isn't happening again and again. Yeah. What are some other kind of protections or I guess kind of measures that, that can come up in mediation? I mean, is it just whatever creative solution the parties come to or are there limits of, of kind of what you would see come out of a mediation settlement? It's usually money, <laughs> um, to be blunt. <laughs> um, there definitely can be, you know, some clients, um, they want a letter of apology. Um, and so I don't want to be harsh or, you know, insensitive. Um, there can be kind of intangible objects or, you know, goals and whether it's a letter of apology, um, sensitivity training, it can be getting your job back. If you were fired, for example, as a result of reporting sexual harassment, the EEOC can advocate, help you advocate for being reinstated, meaning going back to your job um, and hopefully going back to your job in a means of, you know, what happened to you before isn't going to happen again and you're not going to be punished. We're seen as kind of the black sheep of the workplace. Um, but really, realistically, um, you're asking, you're deciding for what amount of money am I willing to release my legal claims, meaning I, I not, can't sue them again, or I can't sue them in the future um, for the discrimination I experienced. So let's talk about the Texas Workforce Commission real quick. So we talked about the EOC, which is the federal government. Now, if they don't file a complaint with the EOC, they can file a complaint with the Texas Work, Workforce Commission. The, does the state level work similar to the federal level? Or is it just better to go straight to the EEOC? Um, the state level, there is definitely a partnership and it's a little bit complicated, but once you're, once you, Vanessa mentioned a right to sue and that's a, like a letter you get notifying you typically that the investigation has been closed and it could be for a variety of reasons. Most often it's that the agency will say something to the effect of we lack the resources to continue investigating. Um, we have not found you know, we can't hold either way. We don't know if what you both alleged occurred. Here is your right to sue. And that means that you have a certain number of days to file a lawsuit. You don't have to file a lawsuit, but if you want to pursue those claims, you must do it within that deadline. And so there's a process for getting that right to sue, like permission to sue in both the, at the federal level and the state level. And that matters because um, there may be, and this is why an attorney is helpful. There may be reasons that you'd rather file in state court versus federal court. Sometimes juries are um, going to be better at one level than the other, but that's you know beyond what most people are the, in most people's knowledge at, without a lawyer. Um, but for the Texas Workforce Commission, um, you can file a charge of discrimination. Most people end up going to the EEOC. I think it's because they have a more friendly website. Um, really um, more than anything else. Um, usually there's a partnership agreement where only one agency is gonna investigate. So you really shouldn't end up with both agencies investigating and like, I mean, you risk always that they come to a different conclusion and they're not gonna duplicate their work. They already don't have enough people. So they're gonna decide it's one or the other. Um, and one, I what up to very recently, an important distinction was that so for Title VII, for sexual harassment, you have to have 15 or more employer employees. Um, so the federal law is really governing decent-sized employers. Um, I mean, depending on your perspective, that may still be a very small workplace because many people work in a workplace with hundreds of people. Um, but there are lots of workplaces in Texas that have under 15 employees. So up till just a couple, within the last couple of months, it was difficult to bring a claim for sexual harassment with the liability going to the employer. Um, Texas um, enacted a law that now protects workplaces, um, enables you to bring a sexual harassment claim under state law for um, workplaces with one or more employees. So that was a really big loophole that's now been closed. And I think that's going to continue to evolve. There will be challenges to that I'm, in court, I'm sure. But for now, um, it's open to many more people. 
And it's a very quick summary of something that's rather complicated, but, um, and I imagine Vanessa works in a, Mr. Cooper is a much larger company than yeah. most companies that have HR have more than 50 employees. Absolutely. <laughs> So Vanessa, do you see a lot of EEOC complaints or Texas Workforce Commission complaints or both? More so than anything, it's EEOC. Um, mm -hmm. And I think kind of like to Colleen's point, not only is it, a, you know, a more of a welcoming website, but I think it's just brand recognition, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's easier for someone to be like, oh, I'm just going to go to the EEOC. And then I think a lot of times too, the Texas Workforce Commission is associated with unemployment, mm -hmm. not so much associated with, you know, filing a, an harassment claim. Mm -hmm. Vanessa, would, so let's say you're in mediation with the EEOC. Um, is that something HR would handle or would there be another representative from the company who would handle it from their side? So normally on the corporate side, it would be our legal department that would handle that. So from an HR perspective, I would be the one that would get the claim from the EEOC and I would have to do what we call the, the position statement, which is responding to the actual claim from the claimant. Um, and you know what, what I will say is there's a lot that goes into drafting those position statements. That's why I think to Colleen's point, sometimes it could be a little challenging when it comes to sexual harassment claims. So what this is this kind of a, sorry, this is like no, an imbalance that we like when you're looking at someone who maybe doesn't even speak English, but managed to mm -hmm. file a charge with the EUC who does have language or does have support for languages other than English, um, but you just, you're kind of adding barrier after barrier. Someone's managed to file a charge. They're kind of up against a company who has a professional preparing the statement. Um, so when it becomes a, he said, she said, you know, the EUC, despite its mission, people are not immune from just looking at a poorly worded complaint and looking at something that looks really professional and having that color their opinion of what happened. Um, so it is, again, it's, it is, it's unfortunately challenging to represent yourself, though it absolutely should be and needs to be, continue to be an option um, for everyone. I literally just lost my train of thought. <laughs> Sorry. And I will no, say, like, one thing, if you're, it's, it's something if you can't find a lawyer, if you tried, and this is a reality for many, many people, so I don't want to diminish that truth, um, but something that happens is that people start the EEOC process on their own. And that's important. If you're going to miss the deadline because you don't have a lawyer, you should start it no matter what. Um, but sometimes when you then go to look for a lawyer, lawyers can be reluctant to pick up where you left off because they mm -hmm. feel like they would have done it differently. Um, and somehow you may have hurt your chances. So it's just like, it's just these factors to consider. And not to wait to look for legal assistance, but if you're not finding it, then you need to take action yourself. And don't give up the hunt, but don't let not being able to find an attorney mean you miss the deadline. That's a really good point. Yeah, good. And, and I even tell, you know, some people that I'm connected to, like, if you can't find an attorney or maybe at, at a particular time, you don't have the resources to get an attorney, call somebody like me that is accustomed mm -hmm. to drafting those statements knows the language that needs to be used, get some free assistance from, from, you know, someone that you really trust to help draft your complaint also. So can a third party who witnessed um, the sexual harassment, can they file a complaint? And can they file a complaint with the EEOC? They can file a complaint with mm -hmm. the EEOC. Um, however, the person that is actually experiencing the harassing is going to have to be willing to give validity to that claim. And usually an added dimension to that situation where a third party would be filing a charge at the EEOC, it's because they've experienced some kind of retaliation. Um, because if you haven't been discriminated against and you haven't been retaliated against personally, um, there's nothing really for you to recover and from a legal perspective, oh. although it is important to be, a, you know, I think what we've come to understand more and more and what, you know, corporate sexual harassment trainings are moving towards is that 
bystanders and bystander intervention is incredibly important in terms of a tool to stop this behavior in the workplace that, um, you know, managers, assuming the manager is an upstanding person and, you know, not doing the harassment themselves, um, managers can't be everywhere, especially more and more as workplaces go remote or get fractured into many different locations. You know, you don't have someone, an HR person at every location. You don't have someone who's watching. Um, so to the degree you witness something, um, it's important to speak up, even if the person that was victimized ultimately decides uh, not to pursue it. You're creating a safer workforce for everyone is the idea. So then a third party couldn't file on behalf of like, you know, their friend or their their loved one. Like if their loved one is like, you know, I'm in a hostile work environment. I've been sexually harassed. I am terrified and scared to file this complaint. And if they say, you know, could they that's could they file it for them, even though they're not um, seeking anything from it, you know, because it didn't happen to them. But this person is coming to them in dire need and they're just, you know, just terrified to file. Well, I would, en- I would encourage that third party to report it to their employer, to their HR department, to give them the opportunity to look into the claim and to, and to provide a resolution. So somewhere within that you know, resolution process, that person that was actually harassed may have a, a change of heart. They, they may want to be that person that steps up and says something. But again, give the, the employer the opportunity to resolve the issue, and which will give that claim, if you have to move it forward, more power by saying, yes, I did attempt to, I, I gave them the opportunity, nothing was done, then you take the next steps. And I'm, I don't actually know the answer to that. I'm not familiar with someone who has I've done that. It's not something I've seen. Um, there can be very limited circumstances in which you can try to move forward at the EEOC using a pseudonym um, or not, not revealing your address because you may feel like the employer could do some, you know, find where you live and do something bad to you. Um, you know, obviously, a pseudonym may work for kind of anything that goes in, ultimately ends up in the public setting, like a a lawsuit. At the EEOC, the matter is supposed to remain confidential, but it's -hmm. it's confidential in that the EEOC has to tell the employer who says they were harassed. Um, You know, maybe in certain circumstances, they're looking at a widespread complaint and would able to remain somewhat anonymized, but most often this is one person making a very specific claim and the only way the company has a fair chance to respond is to know who has complained. And what the company does with that information, you hope, like as Vanessa said, the gold standard is to maintain the confidentiality. If they have to interview other people, they press upon other people that it is the expectation not to speak about this, um, you know, not to reveal people's confidences. That doesn't always happen. So it's something that you know, complaints are often really concerned about just to kind of protect their privacy as well as their reputation. Just kind of want to piggyback on that because Brandy just sort of made me think of something. I had a situation where working in the restaurant industry, I was sexually harassed by a supervisor and one of my trusted coworkers I was telling about, we worked at different places, but was telling this person about what had happened to me. And this person took it upon themselves to go make a report to somebody that was over my manager doing this. And they subsequently told me they did it before HR jumped into action. Um, but in a situation like that, would would my friend be able to make an anonymous complaint to HR and have it investigated? Maybe that friend is worried that it would jeopardize that friendship that he or she disclosed something I'd said in confidence. Yeah, absolutely. They can make an anonymous claim. Um, there should be in most companies where you can submit your claim anonymously. And again, some of them have hotlines that you can call. Um, some have what they call the ombudsman, where you can report, you know, those inappropriate behaviors. So yeah, a, a tip can come in anonymously, but we have to have some kind of substance to be able to investigate. It can't just be, you know, I witnessed a coworker of mine being harassed. Well, harassed by who? Where did it happen? We have to have something to be able to look into. Then it goes into the minimum you need is just who, what, when, where, and how. Yes. 
dates would be great too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, this is something else, like just to keep in mind and often you're looking back on like in, in hindsight, well, I wish I would have done this. And this is, I think most common to people who this it, the situation ramps up. And so at the beginning it is the maybe innocent teasing. A person doesn't know any better. Um, you don't necessarily react badly to that. You want to, you know, remain like friendly. You're new at the job. You want to be polite. You're not welcoming the behavior, but you're also just being polite. It escalates. Your reactions may start to make clear this is very unwelcome. I do not appreciate this, but you know, you're still waiting to report to HR. Um, you should write down those things. You should also have reported them at the time, but if you're not going to do that, and even if you are, write it down, keep a journal to yourself. Um, that kind of stuff can be important later on. Um, and this cuts both ways, and this is way too lawyery. You know, sometimes those notes will end up being um, what's called discoverable and being produced to the other side. Um, so in, I don't wanna make it sound super rosy because in some situations it could be harmful, but most often, it's not, it's just a log of what happened and our memories are super fallible. Um, we think we can remember things much better than we actually can. It's very easy to get dates confused. Um, and the minute, a lot of our legal system is based on credibility. And when you start to look confused and it's not because you're lying, it's just because for many, many, uh, you know, understandable, justifiable reasons you have gotten confused you can start to lose some of that credibility, which is unfair, um, but it, it is just a reality. So having that reference point or having maybe better than that, sent an email to HR, put a note in writing, I'm telling you, I'm notifying you, this is what happened. It is unwelcomed, it is inappropriate. What can be done about it? Um, that can all help later on. So, um Let's go back a little bit, Colleen, you mentioned that during this process, there's a lot of trauma that can be involved. So mm -hmm. does, um, like, does companies provide any counseling services during the process of them filing, the, like going through the complaint process or the EEOC process? And that's Not the companies I sue, <laughs> but <laughs> maybe Mr. Cooper. <laughs> Companies do provide resources, <laughs> not, not necessarily connected to, you know, a complaint that's filed, but most companies have under their wellness plans, a EAP program, employment assistance program, where they will, you know, they offer some, you know, counseling, um, you know, being able to deal with stress, you know, those kind of things. Um, a, a lot of companies now are, are even, you know, extending themselves to provide um, like resource counseling where if you want to take a seminar to better understand, you know, what harassment is, you know, things like that. So there are resources that companies will offer. Um, there's also, I mean, it's important, I think, to recognize that sexual violence is a spectrum and you know, the law uses the term sexual harassment and that's you know, discrimination based on sex. But within that, you know, we're talking about fairly mild, and I hate to say fairly mild because it doesn't mean it's mild to a person, but what society considers fairly mild and maybe a joke that's offensive to like very, very serious um, incidents that can be rape and people get raped at work and, it, and it's horrible. Um, and so Depending on the situation, like when we said before that there could be some overlap with the criminal justice system, there may be other resources to get therapy. Um, you know, when there's a criminal complaint involved, the Crime Victims Compensation Fund can mm -hmm. help um, survivors access those services. So it may not be something that's limited, um, you know, to looking at what the employment, the employer offices, um, employer offers. In some cases, you can fall under a workers' comp claim depending on what happened at work um, and you know that may cover medical expenses which could include therapy I think more and more policies are tracking towards including mental health and recognizing that as a really important facet to our overall facet to our overall well-being um, but it's very case by case specific mm -hmm. I will also piggyback that and say that there are a lot of uh, sexual assault resource centers around mm -hmm. the state who provide services to people who've been victims of a range of, of some form of sexual violence, and they are often available to offer counseling 
um, at least on a short term basis for free for people who are seeking other services from them. Yeah, and I think one other plug for the, your rights under the law, um, which is tangentials is sexual harassment, um, but not exactly the same, is like if you have, if you are a survivor, whether the incident happened in the workplace or outside of the workplace, but you're experiencing like hardship in the workplace because you were assaulted, you know, something else that HR helps with that the EEOC enforces when it goes wrong is um, claims for time off, um, you know, which could be fall under Americans with Disabilities Act. Um, you know, a lot of people don't think they have a disability, um, but the ADA um, is quite broad in what's considered a disability. You don't have to have a permanent or disfiguring or a chronic illness to have a disability under the law. It can be something more temporary and it can, when it's at a certain level, be things like you know, anxiety, depression, PTSD, mm -hmm. which we see a lot as people develop um, after they've been assaulted. And you know, in those contexts, what you could be working on with HR is not that I want you to solve this sexual harassment issue, is that I need an hour off on Mondays because I need to go to therapy. What can mm -hmm. we do about that? Um, and then it's the whole, you know, they call it an interactive dialogue where you're making a request for an accommodation, whether it's time off to go to therapy, um, to work in an office with low light because bright light is triggering to you. And, you know, the company is asking themselves, like, can we do this? Can we continue the business and make this accommodation? Um, or is it you know, too hard? But yeah, I mean, these people, often our clients are experiencing it's not just one issue. It's not right. just one isolated issue. It's, it's sexual harassment. It's housing. It's you know trauma in a past life, um, and it can be hard to find a lawyer who can help with maneuver through. Yeah, all of that. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, ladies, this has been a really wonderful and super interesting discussion. We're coming up on an hour now. Um, I, I, we always like to end these. If, if somebody is experiencing some form of sexual violence or sexual harassment at their workplace, and they are not fortunate enough to work at a workplace where Vanessa is their HR professional, <laughs> what are some things that y'all would recommend that they do? Where maybe resources they can look into, something like that? I would, I would say please, please, please file your claim. If, if you don't have that HR person um, at your company, your voice still needs to be heard. Make sure that you get um, your complaint on record. Um, I think that that's true. Um, I think it's a more difficult um, for some people who work in workplaces where they have a reasonable fear of being retaliated against. And it's worth mentioning that you're protected from retaliation for making a complaint of sexual or report of sexual harassment, either as the person who has been harassed or a person who witnessed the harassment. Um, but you know what we know to be a protection under the law is not always super comforting to people who have in the meantime lost that job and lost their source of income. Um, and you know, sexual harassment happens to everyone um, it happens to people who are undocumented um, and, you know, or people just in life situations where a job may, it may be harder to find a new job. And so there's lots of reasons why people kind of put up with behavior they know to be wrong. Um, but we do want to encourage everyone to take, you know, to, to protect themselves, to make that report, to seek help. Um, I think the EEOC, their website is pretty informative as to what is sexual harassment. Um, as well as all the other forms of discrimination um, that you can experience in the workplace. But just Googling, and you want to check, obviously, that it's, you know, a reliable source, um, but many um, nonprofits, kind of rape crisis centers, uh, domestic violence shelters, they see these issues come up and they may have a page, um, a brochure, or a link on their website. Um, and when you, you know, started the website of a trusted organization, you know, you Typically, those are good places to start to seek out information. Um, I think contacting legal aid, uh, so whether it's Lone Star Legal Aid, Texas Rio Grande Legal Aid, Legal Aid of Northwest Texas, the Equal Justice Center also handles these claims. Um, that's a good place to start. Um, if you have the resources, trying to contact a private attorney, um, they may charge for a consultation, but if you can pool that money together, um, it can be a really 
worthwhile investment to get an orientation, um, especially if the issue is, if, if, if you still have the job um, and you want to know what, or like, what are the steps I need to take next? Um, you know, that can be a point at which that attorney may not be looking to represent you, but a consultation that is a couple hundred dollars um, could set you up for, you know, better success, whether that means keeping the job and having the issue resolved or in, you know, worst scenario, protecting your legal claim that you may have after getting fired or experiencing some adverse action uh, at work. Well, thank you, ladies. Again, this is very informative. I learned a lot. <laughs> so it was like, this was really good. Thank you again. Um, again, if you have any, if you're experiencing, and I say this after every show, if you are experiencing any type of sexual harassment or anything, do not sit in silence. If you know somebody who is experiencing that, um, encourage them to file a complaint or file a complaint with your HR, but also be a friend and listen. So do not be judgmental, do not force it out of them. Just listen and be there for them. And you can always contact Lone Star Legal Aid if you're in the Houston area, um, the Belton area, Waco area. If you're in 72 counties, <laughs> you can contact <laughs> Lone Star Legal Aid. <laughs> so that is all we have. Thank you, ladies. And Brittany, you have anything else? No, ma'am, you covered everything. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank, thank you. you. This is great.